what are you going to do? Amen. Appreciate the music this evening. The young ladies singing that uh, there's going to come a time when we're going to get carried away. Amen. It won't be right now. Calm down. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> I was talking to uh, Paige and Connor earlier about the fruit of the Spirit and uh, how Paul says, you know, there's no law against these things. I said, well, regardless of the experience of some in Baptist churches, there's not any law again. Like there, you can't have. There's not like a limit. Like you can have this much joy, <laughs> right? God never passed any law that said you can only have so much joy. You've heard people make stupid comments like nobody ought to be that happy, <laughs> or nobody can really be that happy. Maybe you've never been that happy. <laughs> But I guess we do know people like that. If they've never done it, it's not possible kind of thing. But <clears throat> No, there's no law against too much joy, and one day I think we will get carried away. Appreciate the uh, what will you do, and also the um, to be a little more like you. goes very well with the sermon this morning, both of those. Talking about um, some of the things around what do we do in this life when things aren't going the way we would maybe wish them to go. Uh, it probably just means we have the wrong wishes, not the wrong circumstances. Uh, but the circumstances that God has ordained for us are a gift from Him, and they really should provoke us to seek opportunity to magnify our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And if we're seeking that, uh, then we can find good in every circumstance because there's always an opportunity to magnify our love for Christ in this world. Turn, if you would, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 29 this evening. We're going to talk about something that's kind of related to what we discussed this morning in some respects. Uh, but again, it's another uh, thing that um, has been brought up by a number of people at various, um, in various ways recently in my life. And so I try to be sensitive to those things and see what's on the mind of the congregation and what kind of questions people may have. Uh, so we're going to look a little bit at this this evening. And we're going to be talking about uh, God's will. And, and there's too much to talk about in one Sunday afternoon service uh, to discuss all the things related to God's will. But we do want to at least understand uh, when we throw that term around, uh, we need to at least have some understanding of what it is that we're talking about because it can be used in Scripture and the Holy Spirit does use it in different ways. And so we can't simply say God's will necessarily and know immediately what exactly we're talking about. Uh, but this kind of stems from the idea of um, you know, some people, uh, you know, seek very hard in, in some respects. They want to know God's will, uh, but they want to know the aspects of God's will that he's never revealed to anyone. Uh, but the things that he has revealed, they're not interested in that. Uh, that's not helpful. And so I find it it's interesting just building a little bit on the person of Christ and his humanity that we talked about this morning, that as the scriptures um, teach us, uh, rightly, that in his humanity, Christ was not divine. Right? These are two different natures that Christ in his person shares, and that in his humanity, he's not omniscient. If Christ in his humanity were omniscient, he wouldn't have been a man, because men are not omniscient. But everything he did know was true, it was perfectly true. And so I think it's important to understand when we read this passage, we're talking about uh, something Moses is teaching us, who knew a little bit about these things. Uh, there's not a lot of people that talked with God face to face as a man speaks with his friend, uh, but Moses did. So he knew some things about the Lord, and also Jesus Christ himself bears witness to this when he admits unashamedly there's things the Son doesn't know. Now, for him to say that, obviously, during the, in the days of his flesh and his earthly ministry, Christ is not ashamed to say there's stuff I don't know. So that should give us a little bit of a clue that it's okay if there are things about the will of God that he's not told us, that we don't know. Because Jesus himself said, I don't know. That's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, it's just remarkable, the mystery of that, but it's remarkable that um, I don't have a problem grasping that, but also the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to have a problem just revealing that to us very candidly. And I think that's even, uh, and I've heard it said, and I agree, that's a very strong witness for the fact that the Bible was not written by men. Because if you had a group of men who were trying to prop up a false idea of this Jesus that they followed, which have many people have said, oh, they just wrote those books, they stole the body, and they all kind of agreed and together to make Jesus into something more than he was, 
you would never put that in your gospel, right? You would never have uh, the Jesus that we would create. We wouldn't have him saying, I don't know. Or we would never come up with that. Uh, but this is the truth of Jesus Christ, that he is both God and man, right? And so that we, we may grasp, obviously, struggle to grasp that mystery, but not a contradiction in any sense. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says something very similar here at the end of this passage. And uh, in the context, he's talking about all the things that God will do. And he's also talking about the commands that the Israelites have received. And both of these things stand together in history. That one, God has commanded certain things. And in a sense, is, that is God's will, yes? yes? When God says, thou shalt not lie, it is safe for us to know and assert that it is God's will that we not lie. And that's, that's not a lie to say that's his will that we not lie. However, when we say that it is God's will that no men should uh, kill, for example, we can say it is God's will, he has commanded, right? Thou shalt not kill. And so innocent lives are not to be taken. Are we then to go a step further and say that it was not the Lord's will, that it was not God's will, that our Lord be crucified unjustly. We'll see now we have uh, gone a, a little bit too far with this idea. And that's why understanding distinctly what it means when we talk about God's will, I think is helpful and important. Because the, the duties God lays upon us as men by revealing his mind about what we ought to do isn't to reveal to us what he intends to do. He's revealing to us what we ought to do. Make sense? And so, but both of these, in a sense, are God's will. And I want to talk just a little bit about that uh, because Moses dealt with it in the Old Testament. Uh, and this is somewhat perhaps theological, but I think it's important to start with a basis of understanding that lies in doctrine and theology before you can really apply those things very well. I think the book of Romans, you know, if you think about the book, the structure of the book of Romans You've got to read about 12 chapters in before you start getting to anything you're supposed to be doing, particularly. A lot of it is the basis of everything we're supposed to do lies in a, not, a proper understanding of who God is and what he's done. It's upon that basis and foundation we now build our lives, who God is and what he's done, and then our response to God in light of who he is and what he has done. Uh, and so Moses lays out some of these things uh, about what God will do. It says in verse number, uh, let's see, I should have like made a little mark where I want to start. But I'm going to just say, let's start in verse number 21. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law, so that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, and that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things, and Moses makes this statement just at the end almost to punctuate this uh, extraordinary chapter as he's speaking to all of the things that are provided for in this covenant God has made with his people he punctuates it with this statement the secret things belong unto the Lord our God but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law our Father and our God, we are grateful to you that you are a God who has spoken, that you have revealed things of yourself and of your work, of your purpose, 
And Father, we just pray tonight that we might be further inclined to understand those things by the power of your Spirit. Pray that you might bless the assembly, bless our time together. Thank you for all the good singing that we've heard and how our hearts have been blessed and touched. That we might be strengthened to go into another week and offering you our very best, being fully yielded to your Spirit in each and every way in our lives, Father. We just pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to focus on verse 29, obviously, that there are two aspects to uh, God and his will or his work, things that he has revealed and things he has not revealed. And this is uh, consistent with the idea of progressive revelation, that there, we see through Scripture that God has continually revealed more until the, uh, uh, lastly, he speaks by his son Jesus Christ, and we're told the true light now shineth. In other words, that finally this, uh, this final illumination, this, this reality that is exposed in the person of Christ relating to the mystery of God, the mystery of redemption, and all the things that have been had hidden in Christ and kept secret since the foundation of the world are now put on full display through the preaching of the gospel after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you could understand, I think, even from a strategic standpoint, that God is the ultimate strategist, uh, why he would not tip his hand too early, and that he would keep certain things secret that may uh, not be profitable were it to fall into the hands of the adversary to foreshadow the, what exactly he intended to do and to accomplish, which is why Paul says that if the princes of this world had known that this was the Lord of glory, they wouldn't have put him to death. Thus, we understand God does deliberately and intentionally keep things hidden and keep things secret to ensure that his righteous purposes are accomplished. Jesus Christ himself, following in his father's footsteps, kept his identity secret. He would tell his disciples, don't tell anyone this until after the uh, resurrection. Right? He would tell people, don't tell anybody who I am. Jesus Christ operated in such a way that he intended to keep his identity at large a secret from the nation of Israel such that only those to whom it was given of the Father would see the truth of who he is but it wasn't put on public display for all to know and even his brothers were somewhat perplexed by that saying hey if you seek if you really are the son of God go show everyone show yourself to the world right and the Bible says because even they did not yet believe in him and so we have these two aspects of God's work, that which he has hidden and that which he has revealed. And it's, as we've said before, it's curious but strange and also understandable that all of us are more interested in what God never said than what he has said. Yeah. Right? I mean, more time gets spent talking about what the seven thunders uttered than anything else in the book of Revelation probably, right? Because people, oh, what was that? And then we try to search out all the depths of scripture and come up with some cockamamie idea about what was probably said instead of just saying like Jesus seemed pleased to say my father's kept that secret I don't know uh, i.e. daddy hadn't told me yet right and if that's good enough for our Lord I just want you to contemplate with me that in his humanity that's good enough for our Lord that it ought to probably be good enough for us that if God has chosen to keep some things secret, then that's daddy's business, right? And we probably ought to stay out of daddy's business because if we had needed to know, he would have told us. Uh, and so and Jesus himself said, hey, if, th if this wasn't so, I would have told you. Right? I would tell you things that you need to know. I would tell you things that are profitable to you because I love you. And I think we can have confidence in our father's character that way. So that turns our attention away from the things he's never said. Uh, or we wish he said, or he might have said, or he could have said, or what he may say, or it, what he did do, or could have done, or might do, or should do, or any of the other speculative areas of interest to what did he say, and what, what exactly has he said. And I think that's where Moses focuses our attention really well, because he says, hey, there's some secret things, and not just some, like a few, there's a lot. Right? So this is a pretty good-sized book, and God has said a lot. But John says himself that if the, all the things that Christ even did were written in a book, the world couldn't contain all the volumes. So that's amazing, isn't it? Like if you were to actually chronicle the life of Christ, John's saying all the books that we even have in all of our collective libraries in the world aren't enough volumes 
to chronicle with, with the right amount of detail to do justice to the life of Christ. And so for all that we do have written, there's a lot that's not written, and there's a lot of things that are secret. So what has God kept secret? Well, we know he's kept secret many things relating to his intent, his purpose. In that sense, his will in that way is known only to him. In other words, when God commanded thou shalt not kill, it's not, it's not in tension with his purpose in sending his son to die in the world at the hands of murderers. And they're even told later that you've been the betrayers and the murderers, right? Why? Because God had already revealed the duty of man is to not take innocent life, right? Don't, don't kill. And they blew right through that one in their envy and had Christ killed and they were justly condemned murderers, right? Get it. Makes sense. So, but these two things are not at odds. On the one hand, from the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was slain. God had always intended and purposed that that would come to pass. And yet, at the same time, God speaks into the world. And when he speaks into the world, he's speaking to those who hear his voice, and he's giving them his will for them. It is his intention, his desire for us to conform our lives to the revelation he has given us. That's exactly what Moses is saying. And you say, well, I don't, you know, you're taking too much time, preacher, dwelling on the theological. But, I mean, it's, it's right here. Moses is writing to a bunch of, you know, for, by modern standards, um, these are slaves. They're not exactly scholars. These are, these are the second generation um, people who had been brought up in bondage and slavery, now grown to adults. They're not exactly going to seminary, but he's taking the time to give them some important understanding so that their theological foundation is sound. And he tells them, there's some secret things. Those belong to the Lord. But what about what he's revealed? That belongs to us and to our children forever. Notice what he says. What's the purpose of what's been revealed? that we may do okay so what is the purpose of what god has revealed it gives us instruction it provides the framework for our doing right so that whatever we do ought to be informed by what god has revealed that's all moses is saying and i think that that makes perfect sense he said we ought to do all the words of this law so these two aspects of, of God's will, this came up recently in a discussion at work, and it's come up a couple times among church people here as well. When we talk about when we're in a situation and we're trying to uh, pray for God's will, right, that we would follow God's will, it it's kind of goes back to what I said a few weeks ago, and this isn't like some kind of a, you know, I was saying that we need to be careful about ascribing things to God and saying, well, you know, God told me to do this, or God called me to do that. We're ascribing all of these things to God. I'm not saying that there's some kind of a scriptural prohibition on that. I'm saying you need to be super careful with that. And you're probably better served to just say, this is what I'm thinking of doing. This is what I'd like to do. This is what I'd like to see happen. Uh, because by the time we pull out something that says, this is what God has said, we can do that scripturally. When it's like, I really feel led to die to myself and, and do something for my wife. Well, then I'm guessing God put that there. I mean, that would be okay. Because I think God's spirit does get the glory when we have godly ambitions. Because apart from his work, we're not very ambitious to serve the Lord in self-denial. So I'm not saying there's some kind of prohibition. I'm saying we just got to be really careful about trying to put uh, ideas and words in God's mouth and let him speak for himself uh, and simply submit ourselves to that. So I want to look at these two aspects. Let's look firstly at the secret things uh, so that we understand when God's will is used in this sense, this seems to be the kind of will that a lot of people are interested in finding out for themselves, uh, especially teenagers. We got a lot of young people, young families. I know uh, it's forever and always, it seems like, among young people, been a thing for preachers to talk to you about finding God's will for your life. It's not a mystery. Right? It's, 
There, there's two aspects to God's will for your life. There are secret things about your life that you don't know that he does. Yeah. Right? You, many of you don't know who you will marry. God does. Should you be praying about that? Absolutely. Does he already know? Is he the end from the beginning? Yes. What's the problem? The problem is you don't know. Because if you did know the end from the beginning, you probably would try to change the end from the beginning. <laughs> right? And God's never asked us to try to change the end from the beginning. He said, trust me, I am the end from the beginning. Right. So, so there's a lot about our life we don't know. It's not about finding God's will in this mystical sense where it's the hidden things. God's will for your life is made plain. Observe to do all that Christ commanded, right? I mean, it's, it's made plain to you. And then Christ says, as we do that and seek those heavenly things, that he will direct our steps. We go back to that verse all the time. The heart of a man pondereth his way, but it's the Lord that directs his steps. How many of you men have ever been unemployed, needed a job, right? Did you know what job you were going to get next? No. What was your responsibility? Start looking for a job, right? I need to be gainfully employed. Did God know what job you would get? Yes. So could you just sit home and say, well, God knows I need a job, so phone will ring if I'm supposed to have one. Because there are people who live their lives that way. Yeah. And then they blame God with their circumstances. Right? But that's actually not faith. That's lack of faith. Amen. Right? You're failing to do what he has revealed while you rely on this mystical, invisible will of God that you think somehow is a spiritual way to think about your life. This is completely backwards. The invisible will of God will never know until it's happened. It's only known to God. And even Jesus, our Lord, seemed to be content with that approach, right? That that's, that's in the Father's hands, and we don't even have to pry and go there. But let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to, right? What's he focusing on? I'm going to obey all the things that the Father has said the Son came to do. Right? So he's submitting himself, completely yielded in every way to his Father's will and so I think that's a good pattern for us to think about how we live in our own lives as well. That we should be content to follow the Lord's leading in, in our life as it relates to his revealed will, knowing that his providence, right? Because the hidden things he's not revealed is where his providence operates, right? He's the provider and he provides for his own. So we might say, I don't know how he will provide. But I trust that he will provide. And while I'm busy occupying myself with what he's given me to do and revealed to me, this is his will for me. Undoubtedly and unassuredly, it's the things he's given me that I'm to pursue. While I'm doing that, I trust his faithfulness and character in his providence to direct my steps. And what inevitably happens is we look back some years from now, right, Donald, and we say, hey, I'm still in business. Some kind of miracle. Right? I know. Right? Because is it because we're such a clever businessman? Probably not. But is it because our Father is providential and cares for us in his goodness? And this is a mechanism that he has chosen to use for now to make these things feasible and possible for the family and the church and everything else? Absolutely. So we trust his providence, even though it's hidden and only known to him, while we lean into the responsibilities he has given us. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 9. You may already be there. I can't remember if I said it or not, but I see a lot of pages flipping. So maybe I hadn't said that yet. I want to give you a couple examples of the, uh, the hidden will that is known only to God and that he has not chosen nor is he under any obligation either, by the way. He's not under any obligation to reveal to his creatures any more of what his intentions are than he wants. Right? And so he will tell us what he wants to tell us, and he has told us plenty. <laughs> plenty for us to chew on and stay busy with. Um, but nonetheless, this is what Paul is dealing with in this sense. Romans 9, verse number 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted what? 
his will. In other words, is there anyone who's ever been uh, effective in their attempts to resist God's will? Paul says no. Paul says no. Now, in this sense that he's speaking of. He says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, and the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? You'll find that Paul's doctrine magnifies God and puts the authority and the decision-making and the power all in his hands. Right? Paul's doctrine always magnifies God. And so it's, uh, it's very humbling, it diminishes man, makes us little, and it makes God big. And so he's saying in this sense that God's will is always done. Now, if we think about Pharaoh, which is the example that Paul is using in Romans, if I were to ask you, what was God's will for Pharaoh? Well, there's two, two parts to that, isn't there? Because on the one hand, God reveals the duty of Pharaoh when he comes to Pharaoh, and he says very simply at the outset, let my people go that they may serve me. So what was the will of God for Pharaoh? Let my people go. And so we think, well, why didn't Pharaoh just let his people go? Well, because Pharaoh was an evil, rebellious, thick-headed, hard-hearted man, just like the rest of us. And Pharaoh says, I would, but I just don't see how it benefits me to do that. I mean, any of us will do what God asks so long as we can see a clear benefit to me in doing it. Pharaoh said, I don't see that. Why would I let all my free labor go? Like, no, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to let him go. I don't know. I don't know this Jehovah. I'm not going to let him go. Uh, get lost, right? So through all of that, Pharaoh does eventually let them go, which is astonishing. Even after 10 plagues, he finally lets them go. And like three days later, he and all his buddies are sitting around like, why did we let him go? Let's go get him. Yeah, let's go get him and bring him back. Remember how great it was? It's so bizarre. Like, we're just irrational people. Uh, and so Pharaoh does. He's like, hey, we're going to go get them. And they go try to get them. And next thing you know, they're drowned all in the sea and, and they're all dead. So God's will, according to Paul and Romans, and even in the, according to the Exodus, was that through Pharaoh's disobedience, the name of God would be made great. Because it was the God of the Hebrews, a bunch of slaves in Egypt. It was Jehovah that overthrew the mightiest military on the planet at the time and defeated all the gods in the pantheon of gods of the Egyptians at the same time. And so God exalted himself through Pharaoh. That was God's purpose. That was his will. So we, on the one hand, we have his command. We have his, his will, his intent, his purpose. We have this playing out all through scripture, right? I have Joseph is a good example of this. Uh, when he's sold into Egypt and then his brothers hated him and all that stuff going on, which is a picture of Christ, the same thing. Um, in Acts 21, if you'll turn over to the book of Acts, we'll see scripture using this same language to talk about God's will. Acts 21. Verse number 14. This is when Paul was uh, setting his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. And all these prophets had already been given a revelation from the Holy Spirit that if he went to Jerusalem, it wouldn't go well for him there. Uh, and so they were trying to, uh, again, make sense of the prophecy. It's, it's not as if God had prophesied this so that they could keep Paul from going. But that's kind of how we often operate, isn't it? It's more as if God has said, this is going to happen, so strengthen your brother, because he's going to be, he's going to have some hard times. And that's why Paul even says, like, what are you doing? Are you trying to break my heart? Like, rather than discouraging him and trying to dissuade him, remember Peter when he took the Lord? This shall not be, he actually manhandled the Lord. The Bible says he took him, and he began to rebuke him. He kind of grabs him and manhandles him a little bit. He says, this shall never be unto thee. And the Lord said, get behind me, Satan. Do you know who I am? I mean, if anybody could ever say that, it was the Lord, right? Do you know who I am? Remember who I am? Don't take me and manhandle me and tell me what's going to be, right? But he's saying, no, this is how it's going to be. But rather than just trying to dissuade me from God's purpose for me, 
strengthen my hands to the work. Paul's saying the same thing. The prophets all reveal this. That's great. Strengthen my hands to the work. Don't use it as a reason to dissuade me from what I feel uh, I'm going to do. So what? notice what the people do. Uh, they saw that he would not be persuaded. Paul, uh, you know, that stubborn streak was put to good use eventually. Um, in verse number 14, when they saw that he would not be persuaded, they ceased saying what? In other words, they resigned themselves to just put it in the Lord's hands, um, not as if it, not as like they're giving it to him, but just to let go of it and just say, it's not our decision to make. It's in God's hands. But in this sense, the will of the Lord be done is another way of saying, this is a secret thing that belongs to the Lord, and we don't know what he intends to do with it. And so we'll just leave it with him. Right? They're not saying the will of the Lord be done like, Paul, you're violating some explicit command that Christ gave in this case. Right? It's not that kind of a will. It's this the secret kind of will. Uh, that we don't know what the Lord will bring to pass or what he has decreed, but we do know what Lamentations teaches is true. Who is he that saith and it cometh to pass when the Lord commandeth it not? In other words, nobody can bring anything to pass in a certain sense without it being God's will. Um, you know, Judas is another interesting example. What was God's will for Judas, right? Well, you could wrestle with that question for a long time if you were just thinking from a human perspective. But we know what the answer is because Judas had been chosen by Christ to be the son of perdition who would betray him to his death. He was chosen. He was selected to fulfill that office among the brethren. And so when Christ turns to him and says, that thou doest, do quickly, it's a charge from the one who is Lord telling him, go do your thing. So sometimes we wrestle with uh, the question in unhelpful ways, right? Trying to discover this mystical hidden thing rather than just doing what is right in front of us. If Judas had been more interested with what was right in front of him, he'd have been better off. But we know that wasn't the Lord's will. Uh, in Romans 1.10, Paul uses it the same way, uh, saying about making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So turn to Romans 15, because uh, it shows up a couple times in this book. I'm just going to show you uh, the one in Romans 15. I just want you to get a flavor for when you see this phrase in Scripture, I want you to at least pause for a moment and learn to kind of view it in these two lights because it's used both ways Romans 15 verse number let's see let's read in verse number 30 now I beseech you brethren for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me Right, so what's he asking them to pray for him about? That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now Paul in this sense is saying, pray for me about this, because I don't know what the will of God will be, but I want you to pray with me that he will allow this to happen. How many of us have been there? We don't know what the secret mind of Christ is concerning this situation. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't go to the Lord and ask for what we'd like to see happen. right? And we ask according to his will. Paul's saying, hey, these are the kind of prayers I want you praying for me so that the Lord will. And this kind of lines up with even James' use of the term in chapter number 4 when he says, hey, don't say I'm going to go here or there and do this or that and boast of all the things you're going to accomplish subject yourself to the Lord's will and say, well, God willing, this is what we're going to hope to try to go do, right? But if the Lord is willing, we will. And that's not just kind of a catchphrase, but, but just cognitively submitting our plans to the Lord's will and saying it could be different, right? We don't know what he intends to do. That's what he's saying he'll, here. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 4.19. You can look there if you'd like. He says, but I will come to you shortly, Right? It's a very positive, yes, it's going to happen, mark it down. And then he immediately follows it up 
uh, the way I qualify things with my wife when I make commitments to her. Uh, I say, yes, I'll absolutely get that done um, so long as I have time. Or, you know, like try to qualify it in some way where there's just in case something comes up. Because something does come up sometimes. Um, it's just the, the life. We don't know what the Lord's mind is about all these things. So Paul says, I will come to you. Uh, and then he follows it up saying, if the Lord will. It's exactly what James is saying. We submit our plans to the Lord and we pray, Lord, this is, this is how I'm planning. This is how I'm thinking. But I don't know ultimately what you will accomplish or work out. So from a pastoral perspective, a lot of people spend time wrestling with, oh, I really got to, you know, I'm thinking about being a plumber or thinking about being an electrician or a dentist, you know, and I just, I'm not sure what the Lord's will is for my life. Uh, and so we're really wrestling to try to discover this will of God in that way. And from a pastoral perspective, I just want to say, you can be in the will of God as a dentist and you can be in the will of God as a plumber. It really doesn't matter. There's a great deal of Christian liberty that this procures for us, knowing that God and his providence will supernaturally direct and guide the steps of those who love him and are serving Christ. And so as we love him and are serving Christ, we can just trust in that supernatural providence of God to direct our steps right into the places of life where we may find ourselves. So we don't have to wrestle as much with reading the tea leaves and trying to figure out what God's secret mind is about stuff as much we can die to a lot of that and say well i don't know what the lord's will is about this i know I was, i've talked with some of you and i've probably said it from the pulpit but i'm getting old um so i don't have my stories numbered yet like my dad did but you know i may i may get there in time but you know when i was talking to somebody about job when when job was re, you know reflecting on all the things that had happened to him i don't think he was trying to figure out you know all my camels died i feel like god's telling me to get out of camels you know, like maybe camels is not where it's at. Maybe I should be in a different business altogether and get out of camels. Well, later on, Job has twice as many camels. It's not the camels aren't the thing. You know, I mean, there are some things Job had to learn. We don't know what God will do. Did Job know if or not he would ever have camels again? No. But wrestling with the question about whether or not it's God's will for me to have camels doesn't seem to weigh heavily on his mind so much as maintaining his integrity and walking before God in a way that's pleasing to him. And that's really where we should focus our attention and know that everything else, right? If, if you don't have a, a spouse, Paul says don't seek one, right? If you do have one, don't try to get rid of them, <laughs> right? There's some simple things that God has given us that are helpful we're not going to discover all the secrets of all the things that God will do. And the, and the reality is we actually couldn't know. We actually couldn't stand to know what it is exactly God intends to do. But do you trust that he's good? Do you think that every gift he gives is good? Then we can trust his character and his providence to guide us into the way that is good. So you'll find this often in Scripture. Uh, if the Lord will, I'll come unto you. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. These are all relating to the will of God in that way. Uh, but in other ways, the will of God is more um, direct. It's more. Uh, this is, you know, theologically what you'll hear described as the perceptive will of God. This is the will of God by which He um, outlines for us what our duties are to Him, the obligations that we have to Him. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians 5 8. And we'll just show you a few instances in Scripture where this uh, phrase is used in that way. My, my point is that in your study, you can't read the will of God as a phrase and just uh, you know, handle that phrase very loosely. Um, and be really sloppy with your scholarship because just the phrase the will of God can mean different things depending on the context how it's used and what it's attempting to convey we've already seen that the phrase the will of God can be used to represent that secret will known only to the mind of God the will by which he decrees and permits uh, all kinds of things for example um, that God does permit the murder of his son so it was a choice God made yes Therefore, it's his will that it happened. Uh, and all those things relate to all of the aspects of what God does. 
But if you're the one uh, who's responsible for the murder of Christ, you're guilty. Because God's already said to you as a creature, thou shalt not kill. Right? All these, all these things that relate to our duties to him. So let's look at some of those examples. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 is probably the most common. Uh, but it's, it's definitely worth revisiting because we find, as we said this morning, the curious place that I think we uh, collectively hold as the redeemed of God are those who will thank him for what he gives, right? Even the, the heathens and the publicans can be thankful when they're getting wealth and health and everything else. But that's not real gratitude in a scriptural sense. We ought to be thankful to God for who he is and what he's done, what he is doing in us also, even though it comes with much suffering at times. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 teaches us, in everything give what? Why should we give thanks in everything? Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I mean, as it touches you, as it relates to the believer, that God has revealed his mind to you, that his desire and will for you is that no matter what you're in, give thanks. Right? So it's like if you have a child and you said, hey, this is what I expect from you. Right? When we're in, uh, when we're gathered together with the church and we're having services together, right, this is what I want from you. This is the standard of conduct. This is how our household runs and operates. And you set those things out for the child. Right? So when the child is not thankful, when you've uh, attempted to teach them to be thankful, what's the corresponding action? Discipline. Does discipline typically produce gratitude? Well, not immediately. <laughs> and maybe not ever. But it's still a part of the process. So it's an interesting thing. We sometimes get hung up in this uh, cycle, and that's why in the book of Hebrews we're told, don't forget... That, that admonishment that speaks to you as sons, right? Encouraging you to endure the chastening of the Lord because that's how he deals with his sons. But one of the things that we're chastened to do is to be thankful because it's not a natural response in life, is it? I mean, children don't come out of the womb like, I'm just so glad to be here. <laughs> Everything's great. I just love you all. And I just want to make you happy. Just... Just tell me what it is I can do to make this world a better place. Because it's just, I marvel at the beauty of it. And I marvel at the wonder of all of you. And it's just such a thrill to be a part of what's going on here. No, they show up and they're like, so this is all for me, huh? Okay. Well, I need this to change. I don't like that at all. That's not happening. And I need some of that. Right? I mean, that's how they come into the world. That's, I've had five of them. That's kids in a nutshell. So thankfulness is, not, thankfulness is not a natural response of the human creature. It is something that we are disciplined in by the Spirit of God, right? But as children of God, it is peculiar to us to be thankful in everything. Yes? If we're not thankful in everything, then something's askew, right? Because our joy isn't attached to our circumstances, as we mature, it should be attached to Christ as the object of our affection. So this is a beginning place uh, for the will of God. So if somebody is saying, man, I'm really just praying. I need to know God's will for my life. What's the one of the first things you can say? How grateful are you in your life for everything? Now, I know some, some preachers qualify this to try to diminish it a little bit. I don't like to do that as much. In everything, give thanks. I understand we don't give thanks for everything. But in a certain sense, they're related, aren't they? If you're going to give thanks in it, the only reason you're in it is that there's some good designed as a part of it that God intends for you to receive from it. If you're in a trial, it's because God has designed it especially to produce something in you that's lacking, that's not reflecting the glory of his son, whom he loves. Right? And he's saying, hey, this isn't cutting it. That is not like my son at all. And then, you know, get a few of these. Get back out there. Try again. Right? You're not, you're not representing the family very well. 
those kind of things, the analogies that we could make. So we start with gratitude. I think as for the Christian experience, that's where everything starts. It's one of the things that's most refreshing about new converts, new believers, is just the joy and the gratitude that is flowing from their heart. And we, not, uh, we ought not ever lose sight of that. Um, in Ephesians 5, 17, we're told to not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We could start at least by saying it's the Lord's will that his children act wisely. We're told we're to do the will of God from the heart. Again, that takes us back to Moses. We occupy ourselves with doing the things he has revealed. We are told that we are to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. In other words, we don't pick and choose what God has revealed uh, that we should or should not adhere to in our lives. Right? Jesus Christ says, forgive everyone that trespasses against you. And we say, okay, but I have, I'm going to keep a ledger of all the people I've forgiven. It's a loophole. Right? It's a pastoral loophole. I have a little book of all the people I've ever forgiven. Just to remind me, I had to forgive you. I know. I know all the people I've had to forgive. Some people kind of live their lives that way, don't they? got a little ledger of all the things I've had to forgive from you. Um, I don't, you know, we need to forgive because that's the Christian thing to do. It's how Christ taught us to live our lives. And it's not as if uh, we're not worthy of a little persecution and the Lord may use someone else to bring us um, to that understanding. So a lot of the things around the will of God in this sense, 1 Timothy 4.3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. A lot of the teaching of the apostles to the Gentiles especially, God dealt with the Jews about this a lot in the law, and it seems to be really at the top of the list for dealing with the Gentiles as well because it commonly plagues all men is sexual sin, perverseness, and corruption and wickedness. And so what is the will of God as it relates to us, right? Flee fornication, right? The will of God for you is to keep yourself pure the bible tells us the body is for the lord it's not for fornication not just not just giving ourselves over to the world uh, for pleasure for a little while but to use the body to honor the lord that's the will of god uh, did you know in most i would say in most churches today fornication and adultery are not necessarily viewed as requisite as part and parcel of the christian faith that many churches take a, a very casual view of sexual immorality, whether it's adultery or fornication. And a lot of churches now, even of homosexuality and all the other the most egregious kinds of sexual perversion there are, are commonplace. Some churches have pastors that are so-called pastors um, that, you know, live that kind of a lifestyle. And I, I heard it put this way, and this is a bit of a side note, but I think it's it's worth saying, you know, that there really is no, you know, we talk about homosexual marriage, there is no homosexual marriage. But what you do have is two people covenanting before God to never repent. That's basically what you have. They're covenanting to one another before God to never repent and to just persist in their perversion. So it's a very serious thing. And the Bible deals with it very directly. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 36, we're told that we ought to have patience while doing the will of God, that after we have done it, we might receive the promise. Right? We're told in Romans 12, 2, to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want you to turn to Mark chapter number 3. And see how a specific instance of this rises to the top of the list, at least for me. When Jesus Christ is uh, teaching here, we'll start in verse number 31. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. 
And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? Was, you know, for all the people who want to exalt Mary's place in, in the scheme of redemption, <laughs> consult the Lord. Um, because he didn't seem, as it related to his mission at large, to talk about his mother that much in the, in the scheme of redemption. He talked about his father a lot, uh, but not his mother. But his mother and his brethren come here, and he's like, Who's that? You know? <laughs> it's almost unchristian, you would think, if it wasn't <laughs> Jesus himself who's saying it. He would think that's not a very... Right? So his view of things is just different than maybe what we impose on him at times. Uh, he says, who's my mother or my brethren? And then he looks around on this multitude and he says, behold, my mother and my brethren. It actually makes sense at, from the world's point of view why they thought he had a devil. Right? Because the way he talked and conversed was on such a different plane that, that to hear him is just like, I think you're crazy. We're just trying to talk to you about normal things like your mom and your brothers. What conversation are you having? <laughs> That's how they, I mean, I'm just trying to get across how people felt. It's a strange way to talk to people. And so, like I said, Christ attempted, he didn't attempt, he, he did conceal his true identity deliberately. Uh, but people are confused by this kind of stuff. And they're thinking, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. And when they admit they don't know what he's saying, he just gets onto him for not knowing what he's saying. He said, how come you can't understand me? And, and I'm telling you, if we were there, apart from God's grace and his hand on us to just open our eyes to things that we're not used to seeing or hearing, we would be right there with everyone else saying, I just don't know what you're saying. Right? He says, behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the what? The will. the will of God. Now, this is not the same will of God that Paul is talking about in Romans 9 that he says everyone does. Right? And so that's what I'm saying. You can't just jump right to a conclusion in your analysis of a text and assume you know what's being discussed when the phrase, the will of God, comes up. Because here, Jesus is using the phrase very specifically about who it is that are actually his kinfolk. If I can use a southern, you know, southern term. Who are his kinfolk? Who's in the family? Well, he said, who's in the family are those who bear my father's likeness. And those who bear my father's likeness are seen and known in the world because they do his will. I mean, that is the fundamental, fundamental relationship between a child and its father. That the child obeys the father the fundamental relationship that exists between that the child depends on the father the child relies upon the father the father loves the child the child learns to love the father right in these ways we are the children of god we're born of god we're learning how to do things in the family the way the father wants them done and he says that whoever does the will of god is family this is my family those who do the will of god because jesus christ was known by this he did always those things that please the father so in your study and analysis of scripture understand that but more importantly in your own life on the one hand enjoy the liberty that we have in christ to not think too hard about trying to discover the secret things about god's providence the truth is we don't have any idea what tomorrow holds I mean, we can make all the plans and schemes, and you can pray as hard as you want. Father, show me what tomorrow will be. And you know what the Father's going to tell you? No. I'm not going to show you what tomorrow will be. And I think our Lord would tell us, I'm, I'm content to let him know. Why aren't you? Look around at my Father's world. Is he feeding the birds? He taking care of things. Springtime harvest, it's still happening. 
Seasons are coming and going. The sun's coming up. The sun's going down. From our perspective, the sun's not actually coming up. What's actually happening? I get it. All right. <laughs> it's all still happening. Why is it happening? Because he's a faithful creator. Amen. Amen. So you don't have to figure all that out. You don't have to even sort it all out. You can pray about it when you have a thing. Father, this is what, I've, what I'm really praying to see happen. And, and it would hopefully be spiritual things like, I'm really praying for this family. Because they're not getting along. There's problems in the family. And they don't know how to deal with it. And they don't even know how to talk about it. And they need help. Father, they need your spirit. They need your truth. Right? Hopefully it's things, spiritually minded things. Not, Father, my cat's real sick. And I'm afraid she's not going to make it. Don't pray for your cat, Josh. Don't pray for your dog, dog lovers. I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm just saying it's ridiculous. I'm saying pray for things that actually have significance. Pray for eternally minded things. Pray for the kind of things that are on our Lord's heart when he walked through this world. And he saw the people in it. And he saw the fields white unto harvest. And he saw the need. And he saw the hurt. And he saw the, the uh, confusion. And he saw the dysfunctionality. And he saw all the problems. And he stepped into it with love, truth, and concern, and compassion. And he prayed for them. Let's, let's pray like that. Let's think like that. Let's live like that. But let's not worry about discovering what actually God intends to do. Please do. As a child of God, focus on his revelation to you. Not personal, unique revelation that you're going to get somewhere. The revelation he gave to his apostles and prophets. Right here in this book. And pray for illumination. That we'll know better how to understand him when he's talking about mothers and brethren in a whole different context than we really are inclined to think of, right? I thought we were talking about bread, right? I thought we were talking about birds. I thought we were talking about water here. I thought we were talking about wine and wineskins. I thought we were talking about, what are you, what are you talking about? Because I think you, now it sounds like you're talking about something completely different, right? Lord, give me understanding. Father, help me. I want to know your mind. Right, so could pursue that is what I'm saying. That's where Moses is saying that's the stuff that he's given to us. Like that's ours. That's a gift from our father. He's given it to us. He's given it to our children. Let's pass it on to them. But that's for us. That's ours. And Moses really, you can see almost the enthusiasm as he's claiming that. God gave that to us. That's a, that's a great gift. Let's Let's pick that up and do something with it. And less time worrying about the, uh, the supernatural divine will that, that is vested only in the Father and isn't known to any of his creatures. Amen? Even angels are curious about stuff. Why? Because the Father hadn't told them everything. Because all of us like a good mystery in the end. And there's a lot of mysteries to be known. I hope that that's helpful. Again, just at least parsing that and, and thinking of it in distinct terms may be helpful to you uh, as you're studying. Certainly it will be a help to you. But also, even as you're just living your life, uh, the older you get, you're kind of more of in a rut. And whether or not God does something different tomorrow, you don't have any plans to. So, like, you're less interested, mostly old people, right? You're mostly less interested in those kind of things. But certainly this is something on the minds of young people who are trying to figure out what I'm going to be tomorrow. What am I going to do tomorrow? Who's going to be in my life? What's going to be happening? What direction am I going? Right? A lot of these things are very unsettled. Uh, I've been there, been through all of that. And the truth is, even as we're older, they could be just as unsettled tomorrow. We just don't really think about it as much. Uh, we're thinking about perhaps different things, hopefully more spiritual things. If that's a help, good. If not, with that, let's go ahead and kill the live stream there.